All right, guys, welcome to Applied Perspective. So I wanted to go over a demo on one point for you guys today. Most of you guys have something that's similar to these two drawings right here, and I'm going to see if I can't perhaps go over both of them really fast in this demo. Okay, so these are from uh, Tony and from Sarah. Okay, they've done a really good job. Most of you guys have this. I was really impressed last Wednesday when I was going around sitting down and talking with you guys because everybody was pretty much spot on in terms of where we want to be with what we're doing, okay? Um, the only thing there is, is that there's just little bits of details, and I thought I'd talk about a couple of those things now on how you can enhance part of your drawing a little bit. So the great thing is, is that everything you've done up to this point, it's pretty much the, the metaphor that I always use is like you're baking a cake. And so if any of you watch Cake Boss as many times as I have to watch it because my daughter watches it like crazy, um, you would know the first thing you have to do is bake that foundation, right? And then everything else is the icing, the fondant. No, I know fondant is right? All the detail and stuff that goes on top of it. Um, and in this right here is a great foundation. I mean, there's plenty of information here that allows us to sort of move forward and draw on top of this. Okay, so I, what I'm going to do is sort of lightly sketch in blue. And then I can put a layer on the top of it in black to show you some differences. So everything here is accurate. Everything here is correct. And like I said, this is the core foundation that you want to have. If you can't get to this point, then you're having a problem understanding the basics of perspective. And if you're having that issue, there's some other issues that might be at play. So, I mean, this is a good, uh, an excellent starting point. Uh, and, and before we even dive into the detail, basically, which is what we're going to do, is talk about little details we can put onto it to enhance the piece and the drawing. Um, let's take a look at what's happening though in terms of perspective, some good things that are taking place in here. One is we have a great overlap of shapes. If you look over here, we have shapes right here. I thought I went to blue, let's try blue again. We have all these shapes over here, they're in a group. They overlap this area right here. We have that area overlapping this area. Uh, the walls, everything is going to that key vanishing point. Everything's correct. We have a cart that's here in the foreground. So the great thing is, is not only do we have grouping, but we also have variation of shape. See how there's like a wide box here, and then there's a little thinner box here. There's a taller box in the back. Um, especially when you look at back over here, there's groupings of three, groupings in prime numbers. So that right there is a little secret, okay? Not that you have to always count it exactly, but groupings and repetitions and primes tend to be one of the best design philosophies. We tend to remember things in groups of threes, fives, or sevens, okay? Uh, if you've ever tried to remember somebody's phone number who lives in England or overseas and they have like eight digits, it's a pain in the butt to remember, but there's something about simple groups of threes and fives and sevens that always works, okay? How many people can finish this sentence, I'm gonna say? Eight, six, seven, Okay, well that's from an old 80s song, right? And, and it's just funny that you can remember that number really quick because it came out, you know, it's a seven digit number. And for some reason, primes are just easy to read, they're easy to see. So when we look at part of the grouping that's taking place here, Sarah has one, two, three, four, five. And that right there is a great way that the composition works, okay? So later on, if we get into composition a little bit more and talk about that, you'll notice really good compositions tend to work when using in groups of three or five, okay, using prime numbers, okay, so right off the bat, the overlap of shape, the groups that are happening, and the variation of shape, those are really key, because sometimes artists struggle with those things, those are three basics that you sort of learn right off the beginning, and we'll be covering, those of you that take environment sketching next semester, we'll be talking about that a lot more in detail. Okay, all right, so let's dive into this then and let's take a look at little details that we can add on here. So one of the, th one of the things I commented to quite a few of you guys about was think of walkways that take place inside your environment. And when I think of a walkway, if you've ever worked inside any type of a warehouse or you've even been, like I know here, if you go into the theater area, they have an area where everyone works and they have yellow tape taped on the floor not taped on the floor, painted on the floor, where you're supposed to walk and then other areas are dangerous. If you've ever worked at uh, any, like UPS or any type of a, of a mailing room or anything like that, you're going to see the same thing. So when I looked at this and I saw the cart, one of the first things I thought about 
was just establishing a base walkway in here. And you can do something as easily just by coming in, coming off your vanishing point like this. And you can say, hey, maybe there's a walkway that recedes back like this. And then maybe it sort of comes back here and it goes off to the side here like this. Okay, now I'm gonna add, so now if I wanted to, if I wanted to put a little angle here, I could just pick between two points, not being really arbitrary right here, just picking anything right there. And I could just put a little corner in like that. Okay, so it's not, you know, two angles meeting each other with a 90. And then again, the rest of it now is just sort of detail. So if I come along here and, you know, sorry about that, that's my, that's the sun keep pen being slightly off when I draw on here. So I'm going to give some thickness to it. And then as this edge rounds right here, I'm going to have it come out a little bit and then have that come forward like that. Now I'm going to imagine that perhaps this area here is like a tile floor and the other area over here on the left, this stuff over here, I'm going to imagine that that's more like just a maybe a concrete floor that has a, just lines going across it. So first thing I'm going to do to create that tile floor is I can come over here and I could just measure, so I'm going to measure an inch and a half from this line. So right there, I'm going to come over here. Okay, that's an inch and a half. I'm going to go over now from right here, measure an inch and a half to right there. I'm going to go over inch to inch and a half to right there. The reason why I did those measurements is that now I can get an exact read. Okay, and so watch. If I come down here, I carry that line forward. And then I'm going to come off of that line, bring that one back, bring that back. So it was an important for me to get that measurement in there. That's basically like a measuring line that I'm throwing in there. So I know exactly how that floor starts to recede back. Now, up here, I want to keep it going. So I have a couple options here. I can come back up here. I can keep measuring over an inch and a half and just make all these markers. So there's another one, inch and a half, and then inch and a half. Here we go. That's probably good right there. Okay, so I had to make these markers up here in order to get the floor in the back. Okay, so what I can do now is just come over here, go off of that line, so you can see where it's connecting there. But I'm going to Command Z that, and then I'm just going to keep drawing that those lines in based off of where the vanishing points are connecting right there. Okay, and you can see how much tinier it is up in the front because of the convergence that's happening in the back there. All right, let me just add a couple more in here. And the other great thing about adding these little lines in is you can see how shapes are like overlapping each other and then the lines are falling behind. So the next thing I'm going to do is I said I was going to make these like a square plank. So I'm just going to come in here and just really lightly. Now that's a key. What do I don't want to do is I don't want to do this right here. Ugh and put a big, thick, heavy line in there. Some of you guys have no idea what sensitivity is. Just be soft, have a nice soft line in there, right? Um, and the reason why I want a soft line is if I put a really thick, hard line in there, that line's not gonna read too well. Let me fix this little line right here. There, it does connect right there. So I'm gonna come in right here, I'm gonna throw a line in like this, going right across. Okay, you know, and I also forgot that line there. It's gonna be going right like that. Hold on, it's nice and pen and centique are just slightly off. I have to go a sixteenth above everything else to get it to be there. And let me get that underline. You can see a little bit of a line right there. Okay, so I got that line in. Then I'm going to come up here. If I wanted to, I could cross, but I can just eyeball it. I can come from here to there and see where it's going to hit about right here. So then I'm going to draw a line right across like so. And then I'm going to come from here, connect through that middle point. I can see right there where it hits. Okay, there. So just adding that floor in, that's a huge change. Because right now it really anchors down the floor. And when I turn off that layer in a couple minutes, you'll see what I had before. And it just was wide open. Okay, so that's just a little bit of detail that really gets things going. Okay, now I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to draw a line across. I'm just going to pretend that this is maybe like a concrete floor. And whenever concrete's pouring, we have little lines across that actually prevent the concrete from cracking. And so they tend to pour with these little edges that are in there. Not that any of you would know that from construction, but that is something that they do. Okay, so just right there, I've established much more of a ground plan. Okay, it's something to anchor it down. 
Next, I could come in here. Let's talk about, look at the walls and the ceiling. What else can I put on the walls and the ceiling that might help this out? So let's go to the ceiling. The ceiling is probably one of the most forgotten areas on compositions that has the most amount of detail that can get you to be associated with the particular environment that you're in. Okay, what I'm going to do, because Sarah already has this in here, is I'm going to go up with her ceiling. So I'm going to draw a couple lines going upward like this. And I do this on quite a few of your drawings, but I thought I'd cover it now. I'm going to pretend that these are beams up here and then I could see past the beams. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line across. It's going to be equal. It's going to be hitting all of these heights right here. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go off that corner and receive that back. Let's come here and receive that back. See that. And let's come back to here. Like so. Okay. So now that I've done that, those look like they could be, you know, uh, two by four beams that are going across. And then if I wanted to, I could even come in here and I could intersect them with another beam going horizontally. So if I did that, all I have to do is draw lines pretty much going across like this. Find out where that line's gonna hit here. On the base, it's going to go across right there, right here. And then I'm going to give some thickness to that line. So let me go back and move my ruler up just a teeny bit. Okay. And then that line is going to go up right there, right? I'm putting in another 2 by 4 So I can come in here. Let me erase this real quick. Let me see if I can dull my... So now I'm going to erase this right here and erase that little overlap there. It's so quiet in here. Is everybody sleeping? <laughs> Your voice is so soothing. I, it probably is. You should have heard me earlier this morning. Alyssa, get up! She went back because she fell asleep after I woke her up. Sorry, Nanny, you fell asleep. Well, I have to go to work. You're late. Hurry up. But dads. No but dads. Just get your... And then my son is... Get off the iPad. We're going to school. The weekend's over. I'm just checking my game to see how many points I earned on my farm. Get off of the iPad. Okay, now I'm going to draw a cross here. Okay, where all these points are intersecting each other right there. Boom. This one line, you can see it's just off, and that's just me, just the thickness of the pen being slightly off from that vanishing point and throw off that line. There. So now, now I have what looks like a set of rafters in there. Okay. So now if I wanted to, to really add a little bit more, I could see past that if I wanted to. So let me, let me do this on another layer because there's a couple options here that I could do. For I could find the middle, which I know is right here. So if I were to cross from corner to corner, corner to corner, find the middle, come straight up, I could find an edge point like right there. And then I could just put some rafters going across to that, that point. So I could just come in here like this and do this. So I'm going from edge to edge here. So I could have like a little 2x4 that's right in there like this, and I could even give it some thickness if I want. Just like that. And I can come back to the other side, do the same thing. That's what's great about this class is if we covered this now, and those of you that take environment sketching next semester, what I'm trying to do for environment sketching is I had to write it as a digital class. And the reason why is that there are too many art classes if all the numbers are gone. But I'm going to see if I could have it in this room so I could take more of you. So even though it's a digital class, you can still draw like in this room. And, and then I could take 10 more students. And then those of you that want to go upstairs and work in room 1026, you could do that as well. So you could draw digitally if you want, but then you can also draw traditionally. So, but I had to write it as a dark class because everything was taken. So now I'm going to come up from the top of this beam here. Look, I'm going to imagine I'm going to, that there's a little section right there. I'm going to erase this little top part because I'm about to draw that upper support. And it's going to be going from here to there to there pretty much. So do you see how I did that right there? 
that immediately establishes a lot more depth in there. And if I wanted to get really crazy, drawing crazy, right? I could go in there and put like AC vents or ducting, okay? Um, put stuff in there that makes sense. Don't put a bird's nest. It draw too much attention to itself, okay? But I could do, if I wanted to, I could have a little duck here. So why don't I just really quick, I'll just draw like a little duck. Let's pretend that right here, I have like a little AC vent that's sort of popping out, okay? I did too. I thought I saw what? Duck. Duck. Like duck duck like team, D-U-C-T. Not the other one. First thought was duck is a little bird, but then I, I realized yeah, like, that you meant duck didn't mean like don't put a birdhouse, but put a we were, duck. We were doing animal noises in the last class on uh, Thursday. Now you're talking about these crickets. <laughs> yeah. So here, I'm going to put a couple little lines in here for the vent. Sorry, I'm trying to get this as close as can. And it's just not calibrated as well. Here. So I'm going to put a little edge on this right now. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine if I was drawing through this where that circle is right there, and then I'm going to sort of come up and then bend it a little bit. So I'm going to hit part of that line right there. I'm going to overlap that line in just a second here with ducting. So here, now I'm going to put a little line that's going to wrap over that would be going to that other side. I'm going to wrap this, bring that over like this, where it ends right here. I'm going to find the top of it, which would be about there. I'm going to lightly sketch in where that circle would be, like that. And then I'm going to come back in off the vanishing point, and I'm going to draw from that far corner there, coming this way. And then I'm going to come over from this edge here and draw back that way, like so. And then just to round the shapes out, I'm just going to wrap it with some, some rubber bands. So I know right here, I'm on the right side of my vanishing point. So let me just see if I can draw this. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can draw this on another layer. If I have a cylinder right here like this, and I have to wrap that with rubber bands, I know where my vanishing point is, so everything over here is going to be wrapping like this, right? And then everything to the left side is going to be wrapping like that. So that's really, really important to know about from the beginning because if I do it the other way, I'd be wrong. So if I come over here, I know I'm going to have a line that's going to start to like wrap this way. Now, if I just draw from here to here, I'd be cheating myself. The best thing for me to do is to make equal marks like at a quarter and then come in here and like pretty much draw through the shape to find that exact angle and curve on there. And then once I get that in there, I can come in and sort of put that indication for where the ducting might be. So, and then when it gets about right here, it's going to be sort of overlapping like this. And then this one's going to start to curve in like so. Find that other quarter mark. So I'm basically drawing my circles in there. So do you see how I wrap that with a little bit of line right now? And wrapping it with line makes that shape really pop out. So now I have ducting that's up there. Okay, so if I wanted to, now what's cool is that now I have beams overlapping something else, and that those little details really add a lot. That really makes the place start to come together. So here, let's just finish this up because we're almost done. Um, and I thought I'd show you this. Is let's say I didn't want that. Let's say I just wanted to put lines across it. You know, sometimes if I'm on a show and I was in a hurry, I didn't have time to come in and do a bunch of ducting. I would just come in, I would put something. Don't leave it empty. There's always something. Look, even if I come in and put a couple light lines, just like this, barely even touching all each other, it just makes it look like there's maybe wood or some type of plastic or something that's up there. So it's just, just not bare empty and with nothing there. See that? I could do that and it still feels like a warehouse. It's still working. Okay, so between that or between that, it's completely up to you. But just don't leave it, you know, totally empty. So let's go over here. What else could I, I possibly throw in here? Let's throw a window in right here on the side. Okay? Uh, let me make sure I'm on the right layer. Here we go. So I'm going to come over here. Let's go back to my key layer. So what do all windows have? Frames. They all have frames. Absolutely. Oh, that was horrible. Right on that line. Just trying to get it up a little bit about there. All windows have frames. So it would be in your best interest if you start to draw a window to think about your window having a frame. All of them do.
And I can tell you why. I have installed Windows. And in fact, I installed some Windows this summer. And after you install a window, you bolt it in, and then you spray this cushy foam stuff in it. It's like an insulation that keeps bugs and cold air or hot air from getting in. Well, after that, you have a gap between where the window is and where the wood frame of the house is and where that spray is. So we put molding on it to make it look nice. And we put some molding and we nail it in and it looks pretty. So everything has molding on it. So the first thing I do when I draw a window is I come in here and I just make sure I give it a really simple molding job, just like this. And I usually, the corners are usually angled like so. Okay. And then if I come back here, there. Now, the molding usually has a thickness to it, right? So then I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to bring this back a little bit. I know this is really exciting to some of you, but just bear with me and you'll see how the drawing starts to work. Okay. The great news about doing this, folks, is that if you can do this and become proficient at this, this is one of the key jobs inside the industry. And I'll tell you this, every good visual development artist that I know did this for 10 years first. Okay, Paul Felix did this for 10 years. Michael Swinger did this for 10 years. So if you want to become like a concept artist and get really good at drawing, this is how you do it. Okay, there. So now I gave it an inside depth, too. So it feels tangible, like I could grip it. Without that, it wouldn't feel like I could grip it. Okay, and now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put a pane glass window that I might see in a factory. Oops, that was horrible. Let me get that little line, that little edge in there. Sorry, that's horrible too. Let me get that some keepers. Ah. Keeps making that little jump. There, okay. So now what I'm going to do, sometimes they get really picky. I'm going to put another little frame because the window has a little frame on it. Like that. Now, this frame, I'm not going to see it go inside this way, this way because the window is receding inward like this. Does that make sense? So the window is going to come up here and end inside, and I can't see where it ends because it recedes right there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to put some little, those little stripes that come down. I don't want to call them bars because they're not like metal bars. They're more like just little window pane holders. Okay. And yes, I eyeballed that, but I have a pretty good idea of what it would look like. Now, that looks like gel bars unless I put something going back in the opposite direction. So then I'm going to come here. I'm going to go back like this. Okay. And then I'm going to do the lower segment right here. Like so. All right, so there's one of my windows right there, okay? All right, now what do all windows have? I always do this just out of habit. I just put a couple of light little lines going across. They have little reflection streaks, just a couple, to make it look like it's a window. That's it, okay? So now I have a window, I have a floor, I have a ceiling. Do you see it coming together? It, that little bit of detail really starts to come in here and add quite a bit. So in terms of other little detail, let me show you a couple other little tricks that I could do, right? Tables always have tops. So I could come over here and if I just take that top line that Sarah put in there, and I'm just gonna round the edge and go like that, and then come back. Yeah, I forgot I locked the door. Surprise. I can do that now because I'm tenured. <laughs> There. So just that little tabletop, that can be a nice little detail that I put in there. Okay. Um, what's some other stuff that I might have? Well, let's say up here I decided to put another box or two. Maybe there's a sign up here. So if I come back here, um, you know, let's put a door back there. Doors are great. What's really cool about doors is doors indicate height. So I need to make sure my scale relationships are right. So if I look at this right now, here, let's do this on another layer. That's what's great about working in Photoshop here. Okay, so if I look at, um, let's switch to red here. So what's really important is I know that somebody standing right here is about that tall because the table is hitting them at their waist and that also makes sense to the cart. So what I need to do real fast 
is, and I do this all the time on my drawings or my concept art, all right, is I need to recede back their scale back here to the room. See that? I know exactly how tall they are. And then once I go back this way against the wall, I can see exactly where that individual would be. So I do that as just a quick scale overlay. That way I know the door needs to be at least about that tall, right? Because that's how tall the individual is. And when you walk out a door, most doors usually have a foot to two feet above your head. So now I could turn that, here, let me label that as my scale layer. And I could turn that off real quick. And I can go back to my key layer here that I was drawing on. And I could just, I'm decided to come over here and put a door in. So I know the door is going to be about that big. What does a door have on it too? Just like a window. It's got a frame. Always have a frame. Because why? It's the same principle. When you slide a door into the wall, you screw it into the studs, then you have to come back over and um, put framing around the edge where it holds together. Door also has a thickness to it. I can see that inside, which means I'm also going to be able to see underneath it now. I know that takes 20 seconds to draw, and it's a pain in the ass for some of you. But if you do it, it makes your work start to work. What's another thing you see on factory doors? Anyone? Did someone say Xbox 360? I'm just kidding. Make sure you're all... I know it's Monday and everyone's still tired. We'll have to play some Gunther and wake everybody up today. So um, you have a little window on there. So you can see through when you're opening it, going in and out, so you don't swing the door open and hit somebody. I'm going to put a little handle right here. Okay? And if I really wanted to, I could go like this. Oh, yes. And put that little window detail in a little line like that. Now it looks like a window. Okay. So when I walk in, what else is around a window? Whatever, excuse me, around a door. As soon as you walk in in your house, what do they put right next to the door? Light switch. Light switch, always. So I come over here now and I can put a little box here, put like a little switch. And that box might have something that comes down here and then goes this way. Okay. Which reminds me of now when I hit the base, what do we always have along the base? Baseboards, also molding. Okay, so right there, that's a little hint. How to make an environment look a lot better. There's molding everywhere. There's molding on the bases, on the floor. So even if I bring this molding back this way from this wall and I come over here to look on the far side, even though I'm only gonna see it right here, I'm still gonna draw my molding in right there. Because it's gonna add a little bit more depth and then I'm going to see if that line keeps going through anywhere where I can see and look at it. It sure does. It goes right there. That little bit of molding, oops, it goes right there, continues on that side. And then I'm going to come over here and check the other side. I can't see the other side because everything's being overlapped. Okay? Something else I might find on here. Let's just pretend a lot of times you walk in and what do you have to do in a warehouse? Clock in. So I could draw a little clock there, a little punch card clock. Or a lot of times, those of you that work at Disneyland and you go in the lunchroom, you should have, they probably don't put these at Disneyland. They probably take them out because they're cruel. But you should have a little OSHA banner up there from the state of California. It's required in all lunchrooms. And the state, you should, someone should call the state and inform them. It on there it lists your rights as a California worker to overtime, to non-overtime, to being paid. I'm, I don't want to say this in case it goes online. Jennifer shaking her head, no. So if I use your real name, then the Disney Gestapo will be able to track you down. <laughs> <laughs> there. So look, I have a little piece of paper up there. That, I don't even know if that's paper. That could be a little digital reader with a clock on it. Everyone has to meet production at a certain time, and then it goes, eh, and it makes a loud noise. That's where the fire extinguisher goes. Could be the fire extinguisher. Could be Mr. Robot that talks to you. I don't know. Okay? But you're getting the point is I'm filling up empty empty spaces that I have. Okay? So, um, one or two things that I could do. This one box in the rear corner is, is a really large shape. Excuse me, I had to take a sip of my fresh coffee. <laughs> I'm going to turn this into a wood crate box. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to put ends on it like that. Come back down. Let me get this bottom line there. Okay. On a wood crate box, I can see the little lip on it right like so. I'm going to come in like that. Now I'm going to do the same thing here on this side. I'm telling you guys... 
This is the easy stuff. This is the fun stuff. This is where your drawing comes alive here. This is the detail, the icing on the cake, and that's how you always have to think about it. And guess what? Right there is the, is the problem with the majority of artists that are on DeviantArt, is that they don't possess the education or knowledge to understand how perspective works. And when they start working digitally, they start going in and they start putting all the icing on the cake because it's the fun stuff to do in Photoshop, but then there's no structure underneath. When there's no structure or form underneath, the object's going to fall together and it will never look correct. The problem is, is that they're looking at people like Fane Zhu and all these really great concept artists like Dylan Cole. But you know the one thing about those guys that everyone doesn't, that they might know or forget, is that they went to good art schools and they were taught form and shape and they did all these types of detailed drawings and they did it for years in a row. Okay, and there's a huge difference there. They have the practice where they understand it. So when you see them working and they're showing you a video that they recorded on a recording software like Camtasia and they double speed it and they look like they're flying through painting super fast. You're like, oh my God, how do they paint so fast? You're not seeing the past seven years of all the drawing and thumbnails and all the time and late nights and eraser marks through paper and wrinkles and eraser dust and pencil stubs that they went through to get to that point. Okay, you're just seeing the finished effect. Okay, I said I was going to make this wood, right? So now I'm going to draw a couple lines that are going down here like this. Make it look like it's sort of wood paneling. I can make a couple of them look a little crooked. There we go. So that right there starts to add quite a bit to my environment. Now, let's talk about two little finishing factors, okay? I have something I want to put over here on the right side. Okay, and I don't know exactly what I want to put there right now. And I have a couple options. I could put a couple boxes in here. So if I wanted to, I could do something like this. I could sketch up a box right here, just real rough. And just say, hey, maybe I have a, just a large shaped box that's right here. And then I could maybe if I wanted to, I could pretend there's a box sort of this way. That's leaning against it. Like that. Okay, so that right there fills up the space a little bit. I could come back over here and pretend that there is a light, a small little air conditioning vent that's coming out of the wall. And then that was a horrible bottom line, but I could put the little bolts for the corner. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the little vents. We tend to have those little angles on them. Usually I have more than three, but that's okay for right now. Okay. Now what's something else I could put? Uh, well, I could put a radio. It might be too detailed. Radio might be good up here on the front though. Okay, Jennifer? Uh, <laughs> top secret Disney names, right? That might be better in the front. If I said your real name, everyone in Disney would know who you are, and then they know that you're giving up on them. They don't have those things posted in there. Call the state of California anonymously and go, I work at this place, and they have no state posters up there. The next day, they will be everywhere. Trust me. Because you have certain rights that they can't break, and there's a reason why they're not telling you about that. Anyway, um, so I have something that's up there now. I fill up my room quite a bit. But the last two things that I can really do to really add a lot. Almost everyone in this room, when you guys were designing your environments, you tended to design from this line forward, which is a very really common practice. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? So one of the things that I like to do is come in and put an object that goes from here but back towards you, okay? And by doing that, that will add a ton of depth. And the best way to do that is to draw the object existing on the ground first and then work your way up from there. So what I'm gonna do right here is I'm going to come over here, I'm just going to put a box overlapping that cart. Okay, so I'm going to come over here, I'm going to draw a line going this way, I'm going to come off of that VP, draw that going down, draw that going this way, and let's say I'm going to end it. Now, you can see on the screen here, my line, that's where I'm going to end it right there. So, and then I'm just going to go up right here. Okay, and now that I get that box shape in there, get that going, have that. I know my box is going to end about right here, just slightly off screen, and then the corners are going to drop down like that, okay? And if I want, I could erase those lines, but I actually, what if my box is open, and then 
because I'm a perspective master. No, I'm just kidding. I could draw the, the lid, flop open, right? And then maybe this lid is flopped open a little bit like this. I got to be careful there. I got just hit a, a weird tangency. And from there, I hit that end. So maybe this is flipped inward a little bit more like so. Let's see, now I'm hitting another tangency there. Aha! Now I need to make a decision. Just because I want it to be flipped open, I don't want to have tangencies, though, depending on other objects that are behind me. So in this case, I'm just going to angle it down a little bit like this. And we're just going to see the back side of it like that. Okay? And then I'm going to angle this one down like that. Like so. Come over here, draw a line going across. And so what I could do, what I always like to do, is I might put something in there to push me or point me. So maybe I'd throw like a, another cube shape that's in there that looks like there's something. I always throw a round ball, and every now and then I put a fill cylinder like that that's pointing that looks like there's something in that box. Okay? The other thing that that does is by putting that little cylinder, this is more of a composition thing that comes a little bit later, that acts as a directional line for me. It points me in a particular direction in the composition. So by doing that, it now points me over here, telling me, hey, something important's over there. Okay? And what's actually really cool is when we actually, this is a composition thing, but when we get into composition a little bit later, and when you're doing your drawings, one of the best things you want to do inside any composition is keep the eye moving around. When we think of around, we're thinking of round shapes or elliptical shapes. So it might be in my best interest that if I had something over here that would push me back in this direction, would allow me, my eye, to then go off of this, which then pushes me back in here, okay? And then see that circle I'm creating in there that's happening, okay? That's an important part of our design process and composition. So if I wanted to, if I have a box that's there, and I want to put something over here that points me this way, what if I just drew a box that was turned like this on the floor here? Off of another vanishing point. So I'm going to draw this box in two-point perspective. Okay, this vanishing point is going to be right here, VP2, and then the other vanishing point is going to be way back over about right here. So there, I mark out those vanishing points real quick, and then come here, draw that box, draw the top of that box in here, draw this other end, bring it down, and now I have another box there. Okay, now if I wanted to, what I could just do, I'm going to pretend this box is already closed, so I'm just going to erase this right here. And I'm going to pretend there's like tape on it like this. Oops, hold on, my ruler slipped there. Boy, that was off. And my ruler slipped. Okay, so, uh oh. Sorry, let me turn the off. There. So I have some tape on the box. And then that tape might drop down a little bit, like so. But you see what I'm getting at? Now I have another shape in that foreground that's overlapping that. If I wanted to put in this flight of stairs, I could do that. All I have to do is come down here, figure out where the base is, okay? Now, I didn't really talk about stairs, but let's say that I had stairs that came out right here, okay? And then they ended, and then I have railing that comes down, okay? So, stairs in one point perspective are actually pretty cool because everything that goes horizontal is going to be equal and there's no real change. So, if I wanted to, all I have to do is just draw a little line like that, a trace line, and watch, when I drop that stair down there, and once I decide to come over, right, I can then come in and make a parallel line to that right there. See those parallel lines? And you can see where the stair is going to cross over every time. So that's going to come down to there, and the stair is going to drop down to there. The stair is going to go back there, and it's going to drop back down here, like so. Okay, and then it'll probably even come out again, but now we won't see it, because it's off the page right before it hits the ground. Okay? Now I'm going to come back and put the other angles of the stair that's going to recede back. And I'm going to put a little lip on there. Why? Because molding is great. Little details are great. So there we go. Okay. And then I get up to the top here. I'm going to have a little bit of molding there. Okay. What do stairs also have? Railings so you don't fall off of them. So what, and that's going to be a great little shape. I make a little circle right here. I'm going to draw now. I got a little bit of a tangency there, so I'm going to try to push this over just a little bit, like so. Get it up to about here. And then I'm going to just come in here and draw a line. It's going to be going right across like this. And then remember that parallel line I drew in there? It's going to be the same parallel line for this top right here. But now I know where that bottom stair is, so I can know exactly where to sort of end it.
Um, hold on. I didn't mean to do that line. It's so darn dark. There we go. And now I'm going to decide, okay, it ends right here, and that might have a little base arm there. And maybe I just put one base arm here in the middle, like so. Hold on a minute. Let me erase what I had there. I'm going to get it to squeeze in there, just sort of right in the middle, like so. Okay? And now it's a little harder to see, so what I'm going to do real fast is, hold on a minute, put this on multiply. I'm going to add another layer to the back here. And let me see if I have a soft brush. So I'm going to come in with my soft brush right now. And where I put that in, it's a little hard to see. So I'm just going to lightly come across and make it a little bit more of a blue. So you can see it pop out and see it overlapping the other shape there. Okay. Okay, there we go. So you see how my stairs there, now if I come over and I do sort of that same thing for my box here, and then I do the same thing for this box here, okay? So do you see the depth that gives right there? That's a foreground overlap. And again, there's nothing wrong with the way that you guys were doing it. You guys were building from this line going forward. That's exactly what I want you to do. So I've been teaching like, perspective and, and this environment class for quite a long time. I've been teaching it at CGMA for five years and I taught it back at Laguna College of Art and Design back in 1999 and 2000 uh, or 1998, 99, 2000. Now here we are 2014. Okay these are little secrets that if you apply some of these steps you don't have to be the greatest designer in the world but if you understand the basics of perspective and you understand a couple of the really simple rules, like variations, grouping, overlapping of shape. This is really going to help you in developing an environment. Now, there, there are some design issues in here I could question, but in terms of what I call the drawability of it, which is my own word I just created, like the word grippage, okay? <laughs> but the drawability of it, meaning that is the perspective working, are things overlapping each other, are they drawn correctly? The answer is yes. All that stuff's working. Okay, so real quick, let's go back to where I was. Okay, so this is my favorite part, is doing that. Do you see the difference? Because your eyes get used to it, and then you come back and you look. So Sarah's drawing, everything's there, which is fantastic. Almost 98% of everyone in this class had this right here. You had the perspective down. And then I came in and I put the floor, the edging, the little details. I put the back wall, I put the side, I put the vent. And then I put the elements in the foreground. And look at the difference. I have a full-fledged environment there. Okay. The funny thing that most of you guys don't realize is you think this is the hard part. This is the easy part. That's the fun part. The hard part in actuality is getting to that right there. Because once you have that, you've figured everything else. And it's just about you thinking about these little things. And I hate to say it like this, but you do have to sort of talk to yourself when you're working. And you have to ask yourself, I mean... The floor can be two different tones. One side could be carpet, one side could be tile. The back side could be concrete where it's poured going horizontally, and then what's in front of you, it could turn and be poured vertically. Okay, or I mean the change of the X and the Y axis, not vertically, like up and down. But um, so you can create all these different directions. So I could come back in here, and I do this quite often on my own sometimes if I rough something out, and I start thinking about composition, like maybe this. What if I had a line that went this way, angled this way, and then it came like this, and I could switch it up. What if I had a box that was here in the foreground, like this, and then who said radio earlier, right? So then what if I decide to come in here, and I'm like, hey, I want to have old school transistor radio with a little knob here, an antenna, and see what that antenna does now? It allows me, it pushes me back in my composition right here, right? So then I might decide, hey, maybe up here, I have like a towel or something hanging off the edge, like this. And now that's going to allow me to drop back down and push myself in the composition. Maybe instead, right here, I come over here and I decide to put one of those rolling doors. Actually, it should be maybe a little bit higher, like this. And so now I have a rolling door that's in the back. Okay. So the other little thing, so you see what I'm going at here is that I can define the room 
10 times over and just draw in the details and I'm changing the composition every time that I'm doing it. Okay. Now, the only other thing I wanted to put in here that I didn't put in, which is another great element, I drew this on some of your guys' image, right, is I would throw like a crane down, okay? And so let me see if I can do that really quick on this one. Now, technically here I might be cheating on this, but that's a great thing about drawing sometimes is you can cheat. Okay, let me see if I can do it right here. So if I come in here with my brush right now, and I'm going to imagine that um, right here, I have a piece of rope that's sort of like coming down. And I'm going to put this ball on the end of the rope. And then I'm going to put a little square on it. I'm going to end it right here. And oops, you know what? I'm not liking that position. Let me raise it up a little bit more. So I was going to hit the table, and I should have saw that. So I basically what I wanted to do was get a, a crane and little piece like this right in here. And that's going to be on this little cube. It's above the rise line. I'm going to see just a little bit underneath it. There we go. So I'm going to have a little crane there. Okay. And you can't see it, but maybe up here there's a little mechanism that you know holds that, that gets that to go. And then maybe, and I can put some indication on this. So this is rope. And then maybe where that goes, there's like a little heck. If I wanted to, I could put like a little bit of a pulley system in there. And then I might be able to come in here and do something like this, right? And if I come in here and say, hey, from here, it's going to be another piece of rope that's going to come off. It's going to be about that thickness there, which means as it recedes back, it's going to get just a little bit thicker, right? And then if I come in here, I might have just a little, I can, I can just put a little bit of the, those indications, right, of the rope wrap the form a little bit. Okay, so now I have something that's hanging down that's overlapping again in the foreground. So if I come back over here to my magic layer, and if I take that, let's go back to that soft brush that I had. And see, that's a great little foreground element that could be hanging inside my piece. Okay, another thing that I mentioned too that you could do, and this is great, is we talked about lights real quick, right? So lights, again, I have round lights, all kinds of lights. We talked about rectangular lights. Let's say I just want to hang one light inside my scene. And let's just say I decide to come over here and just drop a, a line coming down like this. Now I need to ask myself if someone's height. If I have it go too low like this, why is that not a good light right there? Well, it could hit somebody. The thing is, is I can't tell where the light is in perspective. That's sort of a, 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 an illusion because, well, I can tell. If, if I did this, now you can tell it's hanging behind that duct. Does that make sense? Since it's behind the duct, it would be hitting somebody in, in the face there, right? But if I overlap it and have it where I had it right here, and if I make it just a little bit thicker, so let's say I put the light in right about here. And if I overlap this like this, and then if I come over here, let me get the layer real quick. And then if I erase this, now you know that that, uh, hold on. It's a little bit back there. There we go. Okay. Now you know that this is hanging down and it's closer. If it's not in the foreground, it's at least in the midground, right? Because you can tell where it's intersecting right there. So now I could come in here. Let's say I want to cap it about right here. Okay, hold on a minute. Let me show you a little secret here. Let me make sure I'm on the right layer. Wait a minute. Is it that layer or that layer? I'm drawing only three layers. Let me merge them together. Getting confused. Let's fire. Okay. So let me just merge these together here real quick. Here we go. All right. Uh, one, yeah, there we go. So what you do now, if you want to make that around layers, come here and drop and give yourself the distance. That's going to be the center of your square. Okay. Then what you can do is you can just come over here in one point perspective. You can saw, sort of draw equal parts across from each other like so. And then you can come back here. Now that you've done that, go off your VP and just lightly sketch in a base of a square. See how I just did that? So I gave myself the distance, which is... The, the, the height of the light, and then I sketch in that little square. 
and then I just measured from that center point across. So that center is like the radius of our circle. And now I could come in here and I could figure out exactly what that, how that ellipse is going to fit in there. Okay, and then I could put a little bulb in the middle there, and then I could come over here and I can hang that like so. Okay, now again, the one thing that I can't tell is I know it's somewhere in the midground, but what I can do to sort of bring that light forward if I want is if I were to come in here and go back to that little value layer, take my brush here, and just come in here and do this. So lights are great. Now it brings it closer to me. Okay. And I could do that light or I could do a square panel light if I want. Okay. But all those little objects sitting in my room, those are key right there. That's how I establish depth. Again, let's go back to where we were. Okay. Big difference. But all the foundation's there. So I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna add on all that goodness and make my little piece come alive. Okay. All right, let me stop the demo here really fast. I don't know how to do it on a Mac. It's different than on a PC. Stop recording.